There is nothing that moves a loving father's soul quite like his child's cry. Joni Tada, American evangelical Christian, author, radio host, artist, and founder of Joni and Friends. All right, welcome to another episode of Dad Talk. Dad Talk is my series to bring on everyday dads to talk about whatever is important to them. The goal of Dad Talk is to raise dad voices. And my only ask is that whatever we talk about is related to raising their kids. Today, Marcus Matthews joins me in this episode to discuss politics and your children. Please welcome Marcus to Dad Talk. Marcus, how are you? I'm doing quite swell. How are you doing this fine afternoon? Very well. Um, excited to have you on. And we're going to discuss. So this is going to be a fun topic for me because my son is only five. So he doesn't have any politics to talk about. And I generally, as a rule of thumb, what I try to do is limit the involvement where it kind of presents as if my politics are his. So you see a lot of people on there, they'll say, like, you might see somebody with their kids and the kids are holding up a sign, you know, about some right that they're not going to have or whatever. I try not to do that. And instead, because he's five, so he doesn't have any politics. He's literally, he cares about Minecraft and, you know, Cheerios and his Legos, you know, and what are we going to do next? That's what I always hear. Dad, what are we going to do next? So he doesn't care about politics, but he does go with me everywhere. And so sometimes you'll see him holding up a sign, you know, very generically, nothing, you know, serious, like, hey, you know, I've inculcated him into my idea is just yet. Uh, that's for later. That's for later. So but you, you you're going to talk about, uh, you know, the intertwining of dadhood and politics. So introduce yourself, talk about, you know, let us know, you know, who you are as a dad, you know, your kids, and let's just get this thing going. Well. Uh Thank you for the introduction. My name is Marcus Matthews. I'm one of the hosts of the Black Powder podcast, uh, hardcore libertarian, um, not much of a culture warrior. I have uh, two kids. One's just turned 21. One will be 20 coming up this November. Both of them are in college. And to the point you were saying about your five-year-old, there, there's one thing that I think all dads need to understand first and foremost about being a father mm -hmm. let a kid be a kid mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. adult stuff will come in due time i always used to tell my kids don't be a in a rush to grow up mm -hmm. because you're only young once but you'll be right, old right. forever so that's yeah, the way yeah. I, I look at it. that's that was the immediate basis of uh me raising my kids was having that philosophy and approach yeah, yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, I got feedback. Hold on, yeah. So we got we got some feedback here. I don't know why. Okay, I don't know what happened. It seems to be gone now. Okay. Um, my mom actually said the same thing to me when I was growing up because I wanted a job and she wouldn't let me have a job until I was eighteen. She was like, "Look, don't be in a rush because once it happens, you can't turn back the clock." She's like, nope. you, "You know, you only get to be a kid once, so you better enjoy it while you got it." And uh, she was quite right. And, you know, it didn't really harm me. You know, I wanted a job at 16 and waiting until I was 18. It really didn't harm me all that much. Like, uh, probably not at all. So I agree with you. Like, let kids be kids. And I feel like, I feel like way too many people really try to leverage their kids um, in politics. And I don't try to leverage it. I just try to show that, like, yeah, he's there. And, but draw the line at presenting him as if what this idea that I believe is also his idea as well. Um, I think the furthest was he held a Joe Jorgensen sign when he was with me um, at a Joe Jorgensen event years ago. Um, but again, that was just because he happened to be there and he's right. a cute little guy. So I was like, you know, let's hold a sign. And, and then we went to a Spike Cohen event. You know, we got a picture with Spike Cohen because I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. But again, he's he wasn't voting. And, you know, he might grow up to be a Republican or a Democrat or if I fail, I'm really bad, a communist, you know, <laughs> or socialist. Uh, hopefully I don't fail him. So we will see. 
So in terms of you being political, let's dive right into how that's played a role in you as being a dad and how your kids respond to it and so forth. Well, basically, um, I, I'm in a very, uh, a very opinionated person. Obviously, if you're going to claim the mantra of being the only real libertarian, which I do claim that, okay, you have to be extremely opinionated. And I had my opinions on several things uh, that I have expressed to my kids. The, the number one thing that I've always tried to impart upon them is do no harm. Okay. And that, I think, is a fundamental principle that a society can be built upon. If you, you go into it saying, you know what, I'm not going to steal, I'm not going to hurt this person or do an, any kind of intentional act mm -hmm. to hurt my fellow citizen, um, you know, maybe that shows leadership and they will inspire their friends and, you know, they'll have a collective around them of people that understand that we're not here to do any harm to anybody else. Right. <clears throat> and uh, as far as talking about Democrats and Republicans to my kids, uh, like I said, they're, they're older now, but when they were younger, mm -hmm. I tried to temper it, uh, not so much with my opinion, but with the facts of the matter. Okay. You know, so it, it's all obviously is topic dependent, but whatever it was, I always try to be just straight up factual and truthful because, you know, in our partisan world, people will slant their opinion towards their side and they're not, they won't be objective about it. I've always tried to be objective and to the point with strictly the facts and no feelings with my kids when we talk about politics when they were younger. Now that they're older, we could be more specific. Right. But, uh, like, if, when my son was five, he, he was just into baseball, and that's what he does right now in college. But, um, you know, I would just point out the parallels between life and baseball. And mm -hmm. life, if you don't incorporate the, the aspects of politics, and that's where I think Americans are way too comfortable now, because we want to default our lives to our chosen politician as if they're going to be our earthly savior mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i never wanted them to idolize any political figure as well and that i kind of got to that point earlier on like that's just a man just like your father or that's just like a, a woman right. just like your mother so something along those lines in the early stages of uh incorporating politics and fatherhood with them right did do you, so let me ask you, were you a libertarian when they were really little or just born, or did you become a libertarian sometime thereafter? No, I've been a libertarian, um, not even knowing it, probably since I was in my mid-20s, because okay. I first president I truly recall hearing and seeing was Reagan, mm -hmm. and then I watched the pendulum of the uniparty swing back and forth since then. And I always wondered why. And that's one thing I always, because my parents did it to me. They said, you should always ask why don't just assume because you, somebody told you something or you read something. Um, that's the, that's the end all be all ask why then go look back and see what led up to that point. Because every historical moment has context and things that caused whatever that situation was. Right. And when you don't bring your kids up to ask those simple questions, like why did world war two happen? Mm -hmm. You know, things like that, you know, cause w when they get their uh, history books in elementary school, it's just going to say world war two, maybe a brief, brief introduction as to the causes and it's not really going to get in depth to why World War II started. And you could say that run down the line of every subject matter in, or in their history book. You could say you're not going, you're just going to get the, the government related explanation of why that happened. Right. right. And well, we all know governments always tell the truth. Right. So always. <laughs> always. Exactly. And, uh, <laughs> You, you can undoubtedly count on a very few things in this world, but you can always count on the government uh, 
giving you the information that you need to be a true citizen of this republic. So, right. You know. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny. So, like, I don't, you know, because he's five, and obviously the the lessons are relatively simple, like you know, don't hurt people and stuff like that. But yeah. I have found some ways to kind of like incorporate what I think are like maybe a prelude to libertarian ideas. They're maybe not right quite libertarian explicitly themselves. So mm -hmm. for instance, one time he had a friend come over for a play date and he decided that he didn't want his friend to play with a particular toy, which was fine. Like he has plenty of toys to, to, to share with. And so I said, look, I said, you know, because it, it, it's his toy. And so we do want to, we do want to raise him with the idea that like, you know, property rights, you own stuff, but you also have to, there, there's a responsibility in how you take care of things. So I was like, look, if you don't want your friend to play with this, you need to put it away and find something that he can play with, right? Very simple lesson. And I think it's a prelude to this is how we, you know, like, yes, this is my toy. Yes, I can say no, but how do we do this in a meaningful way such that we can still keep playing together and it doesn't come across as rude. Like, okay, just go put that one away. Like, ah, eh, this one's mine. Let's put that away. And then maybe when he's 12 or 13 and, you know, he can do that on his own. He can just say, hey, this is a, this is my personal toy that I really like playing with and I don't want anybody. Maybe he's building a new Lego, something, whatever, you know. And so did, did you have any lessons like that or were you more just like focusing on just being a good kid, being nice to people, the more generic that's not really related to libertarian things? I, uh, first of all, I, I completely, um, uh, understand that lesson that you taught your, your kid, because I was like, that's similar to what I was doing. And when I was saying you need to protect yourself mm -hmm. because that's the, the, I taught my kids from a very young age, you are your own first responder. You are responsible yep. for your safety and your safety is your most precious possession. Mm -hmm. And then the toys are somewhere down the line, but it's all under the same umbrella of right. protecting yourself. And I remember there was this, uh, I think my son was 12 or 13 and we were in Arizona and he, I let him go off with one of his friends to a tasty freeze or whatever it was. And they went and they came back and his friend was like, Mr. Matthews, your son wouldn't let me jaywalk across a street he said we had to go down to the crosswalk and do it the right way <laughs> and i was like yeah mateo's like that you know he he's he's one that's really uh aware of his situation at all times and you know situational awareness was something that we uh taught our kids early on mm -hmm. and those are one of those things where you get a affirmation that you're you're doing things the right way. Right. And right. I think you're eventually going to get that affirmation from your son somewhere down the line that you with the toy uh lesson, mm -hmm. that's going to expand uh and come into play in many aspects of his life. Mm -hmm. So those are the when you talk about being a father, those are the things that a father is supposed to teach their son. Like right. for me, right. my father grew up in uh Jim Crow, Alabama graduated from high school in 1968 didn't uh well he he went to college at smu that was the first time he actually interacted with uh other americans we'll say it like that on a regular basis mm -hmm. and what he always taught me is you you always take every individual at their self-worth of if i could if that's the correct term but however they they come to you that's how the the energy they bring to you is the energy right, you right. give them back Right. Basically. Right. And that was under the umbrella of protecting yourself mm -hmm. because it was a different situation. You had for him, he had to step off the sidewalk when a, another American was coming at him mm -hmm. or else it could be perilous for him and his family. Right. And that's right. just the reality of the matter uh, for him growing up. And he took all those hard lessons and imparted upon me the the basic framework of don't be like those people 
right or right. let's be a better example of what it is to be an american because he he didn't he wanted to go to air force all through all of that where this country didn't love him he wanted to go to air force service country he eventually went to the army and national guard uh for a while he was the police officer he did very well for himself very <laughs> educated man and he always tells me to this day like i spoke to him right before i came on he didn't tell me it today but he always said as long as you're breathing you can achieve anything mm -hmm. and he's a shining his i've fallen well short of <laughs> of his position in life mm -hmm. and you know i always tell my kids i don't teach you from my successes as much as i teach you from my failures because failure is a much more powerful teacher and life gives you the test and then you can study for it right so right. these things that i'm trying to you know, we, we talk about building a foundation on rock and not sand because I grew up in a Baptist church. I don't okay. currently uh, uh, attend church services, but, you know, you're supposed to build your house upon a rock. And I always used to use that example. I was like, right now, you're building your foundation and you want a solid foundation. You don't want a shaky foundation that can fall between the cracks of your fingers. You want right. a sturdy right. rock that will take uh, all the elements that mother nature can give it to you because that you, you are out in mother nature, you're out in God's world and you need to have a solid foundation. So when the storm comes, you don't get knocked over. Or if you do get knocked over, you have something to build upon again, instead of mm -hmm. having to, you know, find some, a new patch of sand because it got washed away by the storm. So, right. So I'm getting so, to the song. <laughs> so when you're, so when you're raising your kids and you know, you've got the stories from your dad growing up during the Jim Crow era. And, you know, he experienced things that, you know, kids today, like they can't really imagine further than like, say, uh, you know, a history book or a, a film or something like that. For the most part. I mean, there are there are instances where people maybe do act as, as horrible as, you know, they once did. But it's not nearly as widespread uh, in today's age. So when you're. I'm trying to think of how exactly I want to phrase this, but basically when you're raising your kids and you've got these stories in the back of your mind, then you've got your life experiences and then you've got your libertarian values. How did you reconcile all of that? And the reason I ask it is because, you know, I've, I've met people, um, maybe they don't have the libertarian values, but they have some other values that, that, that are driving them. And maybe they've had a similar experience. Maybe they had a parent or a grandparent um, that that grew up in a time where things were much more volatile. Um, and and then they have lived a life that's entirely different or at least better, you know, much better. Right. Maybe, maybe not entirely, different, but much, much better. So how do you reconcile all of those things uh, so that your children go grow up with the best attitude and view of the world? See, um, I, I don't like calling out the politics by the names. You know, mm -hmm. obviously, currently, black people vote uh, overwhelmingly 80% Democrat and whatnot. Um, back in my dad's day, it was actually 50-50. A lot of people don't know that. Okay. Um, yeah. I did not. Yeah. For me, I think black people, you know, and my kids are mixed. They're, their mom is Mexican. But okay. I think... For black people, we're we are naturally libertarians, and we don't even know it because we've seen what the government does. Government is full of shit. Um, excuse me, I, I didn't mean to. It's all good. Uh, but government is full of you know what? Uh, government gets in the way of progress because of the social engineering aspect. Government gets in the way of entrepreneurship because you have to jump through all these hoops and pay all these permits and fees and it can be um detrimental to a a young entrepreneur who can't raise the capital right. and you know there's to 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 get to where he wants to go and when he does he has to take out high interest loans and you know that's why most small businesses fail almost immediately because you know, when he when he was in his inner city school, he would, didn't get a good education that taught uh, money management, finances, household finances. He, they don't teach any of that stuff. And, you know, you have generational issues 
that are that are going on to this day where you know that failure in education that failure um in economic opportunity snowballs to the point where we're at, where we're at right now mm-hmm. and black people should understand that you're not going to get policies and changes from democrats and republicans to get us to where we could have a small business ownership at a higher level we know how to manage our finances where you know our credit uh, score is uh, plus 680 you know this just those simple things you're not getting that under the current system and voting for the same people that aren't fixing the problems because I always say if politicians fix the problems that they ran upon, they wouldn't have any reason to reelect them. And that's why they don't truly fix any problems because what are they going to run on? Because right. currently right. in our unit party, it's not about the best idea. It's about why this person over here sucks. Right. You know, and that's all they have to do is, is tell you why you shouldn't vote instead of why you should. And that's right. what I was hoping the, the Libertarian Party would have adopted that message. We had a grand opportunity uh, this election cycle, and I think we still do, but I think it's been slightly squandered after the uh, National Convention because uh, we we lifted up other people when 70-plus percent of Americans didn't like the two choices that we were facing at the time. Right. And, and and from a dad's perspective, that's frustrating to me because I'm looking at the world I'm going to hand to my children, with, which they're already in the world and they're already seeing this stuff. But as a black man and a libertarian, I want to get that message out to other black people like, hey, Democrats and Republicans aren't going to help you set up your kids for success in the future right. because they have been a hindrance historically. Uh, since time has arrived upon this great nation and we can't keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results and expecting our kids will not have to face these issues down the line. Right. Right. You know, there's an interesting story. story. Um, I got that, I got that back again. again. Yeah, you okay. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm sure it's like a 119 degrees here in Southern California today. And my my little studio's in my garage, and I got fans. I don't think the fans are blowing on the mic, but no, uh, it's, 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 it, I, I'm just I, hearing I, myself after. Um, we'll try that. That, that, that. Whatever. Okay, I'm not hearing it now, so I don't know. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what's going on, but we'll 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 work through it. No big deal. So yeah. it's interesting. I, I remember this story, um, and I don't remember where I heard it from. It might have been a podcast, or it might have been a book, but it was a it was basically like this person was talking to another person and this other like person a and person b person b is talking to person a person a is like yeah um you know they're they're down at the boat dock and they're talking about their financial advisor and person b is like well where are all their boats right and the idea is like kind of like if you're going to a financial advisor they should probably have some level of success on their own right right and like where are their boats and then where are their client boats Right. Like, you know, yeah. where where are the results from all of this? And I think in a similar way, we can look at it through politics and say, OK, let's talk about the Democrats and the Republicans. And let's just talk about it from the perspective of the black community, which I am not a member of, but I make observations. Right. And so my observation says, what have either party? What have they done in, to, to make the, the lives of the black community better. And I don't mean a one-off here and there, like, oh, you know, this person sent out some checks one time, or this person did this one minor thing that lasted a very short term. I mean, long-term, like what, what, what long-term thing can you look back and say, man, I'm glad that that president or that Senator, you know, ran with this. And I, maybe I'm just oblivious, but I don't see it. I don't see anything that they've done that has long-term made you know like really helped lift the black community and so i'm like why would you vote for them anymore because they're not producing they're not they're literally not delivering it's 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 nothing and i firmly believe it starts 
with the public education system and the fact that Americans put too much faith in it for their children mm -hmm. because they're not teaching you to think objectively. And th what they are doing is it, there is indoctrination in, in schools. And mm -hmm. full disclosure, I do work for a school district okay. out here in California. Sure. Um, there is indoctrination in school. And I'll tell you what it is. It's an indoctrination where the government has placed itself in an omnipotent position. Whereas if you question the government, you are being a delinquent and right. you have no place in our society if you don't pull the rope in the same direction as what the government is teaching your kids. And where parents, not only uh, fathers, but mothers are failing is they're not supplementing their children. If your kid's in a public school, mm -hmm. you need to be supplementing their education. Because they're getting a, a basic script of what the government wants in, as the end result. And that's a good worker or a good soldier, marine, sailor, airman, whatever it is. That's, those are the two paths that typically were available when the, back in the 90s when I was a kid. Right. Uh, late 80s, 90s. Uh, you either went to college, there was actually three paths. You either went to college, you got a job, or you joined the military. Mm -hmm. There was no, I want to start a business. There was no, uh, I want to engage in a trade. Actually, there there was because we had shopping ROP classes back then, but those were frowned upon. And, you know, and, and in today's educational system, they're teaching that every kid should go to college, right, which right. I find complete and utter BS mm -hmm. because right. even the people that do go to college, 100% of them do not graduate right, or even make it past the second year. It's roughly 37% of people who start college finish college. It's a very low percentage. And <clears throat> it disturbs me to no end because once you're you're implanting that you have to go to college you have to go to college you have to go to college on kids and that overwhelming majority that don't go to college or go to college and drop out you know that stuff is going to be in the back of their mind the whole time i was supposed to do this i was supposed to do this and as that can lead to destructive behavior and what we're not telling our kids you know the world's always going to need electricians because ai is not going to take that over Plumbing, AI is not taking that over. Welding, maybe robotics will take that over because that's there's already robotic welders and car manufacturers and things like that. But there's trades out there that you can engage in where you can be also become an entrepreneur, open your own business, and you don't work for anybody. You work for yourself and you have complete self-determination. Right. You know. Those are the things that when I say parents need to supplement their kids' education, those are the options they need to put before them because there's many paths to success. And right. what public right. education does is it points you in one direction as if there's only one path to success. Now, they try to fluff it up a little bit. Oh, yeah, you could go do this. It's particularly into government service like the military. And there's nothing the matter with that. If that's your choice, because I wanted to be a Marine all my life and mm -hmm. it didn't happen. But if you're not actively involved in your child's education, looking at what they did for their homework, asking them about what they learned today, and, and then you discuss those things. I, I can't tell you, this was around your son's age, a little bit older, all the way through elementary school. Um, you know, in California, it's all about the Spanish conquest and, you know, because it's a major factor of the right. culture here in California. And then we, we talk about that and I ask them what they learned. They were like, oh, the Spanish came here and everything was all honky dory, they built churches. Uh, the Indians were like more than willing to convert to Catholicism. And you know, that's not the precise truth, but that's the glorified version of your public education. Right. And you know, right. I, I uh, suffice to say, I probably think it'd be even, even worse than they, at a private Catholic school. They're not gonna talk about what they actually did to get the Indians in compliance with their religion. 
Right. right. And, you know, those are the nuances that you slowly have to introduce to your children as they get old enough to understand that, you know, America isn't this uh, brilliant white virginal character that only exists because the whole world was dark and then it was like the savior of the world coming to being when America was born. There was some some bad stuff. And if you can't, history is not supposed to make you feel good. History is supposed to tell you what was right, what was wrong, what worked and what didn't. Right. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, I, you, I don't know how much you're like, I, I'm on Twitter frequently, like too much frequently. And <laughs> right now it's raging about World War II. And yeah. so there's all this debate and conversation like, you know, was World War II really what we were told it was as we were growing up? And there's a lot of questions being asked and, and people don't like it. And it's very interesting because in, in the terms of a lot of the history is painted in a particular way. And then one of the things that I've noticed is that, you know, they say, you know, those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. Yeah. Um, you know, Victor's, you, you know, right history, right, yeah. you know, all these nice little catchphrases. And there's a certain truth to them because when you talk about like current conflicts today and, you know, like you talk about the Gaza conflict, which is not a conversation I'm having with my five-year-old, but if he was 15, we might be having that conversation. Right. Yeah. And what's very interesting is a lot of people justify what happens today by what happened yesterday. So I've met so many people and you're like, Hey, what's going on over in Gaza is, you know, an atrocity. There's, you know, being there are bombs being dropped on children and women and children like left and right. And they're being killed by the thousands. And this is, you know, there's, there has to be something better. And I've, I, I don't know how many people have been like, well, yeah, but look at Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And I'm like, well, that was equally horrific. Yeah. Right? Like, you know, like there was, it was horrific um, at a very minimum. We should look at that and just be like disgusted that it ever happened. Right. And uh, you know, but like people utilize that as like the foundation of what happens today, you know? And, and it's, so it's interesting. It's like, it's making me, it's weird. I don't know if you felt like this, <laughs> but it's when I was in school, when I was in high school, I didn't give a crap about history. And I would just roll my eyes and I was like, oh, why? Why do I got to learn about this? Who cares about the engines? You know, and who cares about the conquistadors and who cares about, you know, all this stuff, Vietnam, like whatever that happened. Like that happened a long time ago. Who cares? Like that was my attitude when I was 15. Now that I'm 46, I look back and I'm like, well, I need to really read this stuff. Like, you know, because people are now referencing this and I need to go back and evaluate. And so this will be, you know, to tie this back into dad stuff, this will be some of the things that as my son gets older, we will have conversations and we will supplement this stuff. But the only way to supplement it parents out there is if you are actively doing it yourself, which means right. I need to go and read some books, you know, maybe listen to some podcasts. If there's some good podcasts um, out there that are lengthy and that can, you know, go through it, you know, because one, you were taught a particular narrative. And number two, even if you were taught a great narrative, you probably forgot a lot of it. Right. Because honestly, in my day-to-day -day job, I don't deal with history too much, like ever. <laughs> so I've forgotten a lot of what I what I did learn, whether it was good or bad or somewhere in between. So it's just interesting. What kind of conversations did you have with your kids as they were getting older uh, related to anything, really? Well, one of my... Uh proudest accomplishments is my son and I, my son, I, I call myself an amateur history buff. Mm -hmm. My son's about to be a professional history buff because that's oh, his yes. major in college. And he wants to be an educator when he uh, finishes his baseball career and whatnot. <clears throat> my son, uh, my daughter, currently her major is psychology and she's going back to school after she gets her bachelor's to become a RN. And, you know, that's a profession where she's going to be financially independent once she uh, gets out of college. And my son, I have every inclination he's probably going to move back home because starting off in education is not a very uh, lucrative uh, profession, but it's satisfying. 
And the reason why I call it satisfying is because of the talks that we've had. I know that affected him because it affected me. In dealing with World War II, I always say this. There is not a war of the 18th, 19th, or 20th century that you cannot trace directly back to a previous conflict. Wars build upon themselves. Right. And <clears throat> when, when, you know, the Gaza conflict, I, I have trouble with a lot of aspects of it because there's a lot of people that call themselves Christians that are simply turning a blind eye to the suffering of the people. And yeah, the Israelis suffer too when, you know, October 7th, that's actually my birthday. Hmm. Um, they suffered grandly and I'm not making light of that whatsoever. And, you know, cause nobody should be going out there actively killing people. But if you look at it from a historical context, you know, the British call the American colonialists terrorists, mm-hmm. you know, every, everybody who called himself a freedom fighter was called a terrorist by the people they were fighting against for a variety of reasons. Right. And until human beings can understand that we all have the right to exist. And that's one of the things that I always tell my kids, you know, you may disagree with somebody on every single aspect of your life. You could disagree with them that today is Sunday. You can say, well, it's Monday in Japan. Oh, you, you know, you could, you can go down a list. I always say it only takes one person in a room for one human in a room for conflict, Mm -hmm. because if there's not another person in a room, you're going to figure out a way to have an argument with yourself about something that you, you, um, ingested in your environment where it'd be media or whatever, you know, humans in conflict are basically like needing water and food Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. conflict is a natural aspect. And Americans have a, a, a weird sense of history because history can only be relevant right now if it's politically expedient. Yes. And if you point out certain history to people, like people always like to tell me because I push back against their conservative viewpoints. I find conservatives more argumentative than liberals. Liberals all just like, completely destroy them and they disengage conservatives you point out the facts and they want to delve deeper and throw out useless facts or like well the democrats created the kkk i was like yes they did and then they're they're out of loss and, and then you know the, the democrats did jim crow i was like yes they did mm-hmm. and then i will ask them who was the first president to institute a segregational policy in the United States government, officially government sanctioned. And you start hearing chirps because it was Abraham Lincoln when he created the, the all black army units during the civil war. You know, that's not one of the, you know, they, they paint Abraham Lincoln as this, this great savior of the Republic. And when you call out the facts, like, you know, racism was pretty much American culture. And I'll, for me, I only believe racism still exists in the American judicial system. Society-wise, it's not socially acceptable anymore to be racist. Now, people out there can, black, white, whatever, Mexican, they can hold racist views, and a lot of people do. Right. But right. if are, are you not able to buy a house in the neighborhood of your choosing? If you can't, there's remedies to that. Previously, there wasn't. It's hard to prove, especially in housing and the job market, that you didn't get this house or or they're steering you to a different neighborhood, which is actually still still occurs, or you didn't get a certain job. And that's going to be even harder to prove without like an eyewitness or a recording of them saying something behind your back. Mm-hmm. Previously, you know, that's one, one of the lessons my dad taught me. He said, I have more respect for a clan member than I do of this guy working across the hall from me. And this is, like I said, my dad was an executive. He did all right. He said, because people have told me what that guy says about me, but in my face, he'll smile and 
pretend we're friends versus right, the kind right. the kind guy you know where he stands and you, you know i respect that if that's how you feel i was like cool i like knowing who the enemy is we don't have right, to right. beat around the bush and that's what i always tell my kids if you if somebody shows you that they're the enemy by their actions not by what they look like not by what they particularly believe politically wise political wise but by what they say do and how they make you feel uh based on what they say and do that's what you should uh consider when you're you're having interpersonal interactions with people you know look at what they do not who they are right right it it's it's always been my thing that i now as a rule of thumb when i'm out in public when i'm doing anything that's related to like a public persona public speaking my podcast i generally tame my my mouth a bit yeah um if i invited you over for beers and a cigar well you never know what i might say right and the sky's the limit on that and but and, and that's just a matter of like I have a certain professional behavior that I think that I want to be known for. Right. But I don't hide the fact that I might have a potty mouth. Um, <laughs> and as a rule of thumb, like I will tell you what I think of you and, you know, and you seem to be a pretty, pretty good sized fella. Uh, I'm five foot three and I'm 120 pounds. And I think oh, people, yeah. people get surprised because they're like, I talk to people on uh, in person this pretty much the same way I do online, maybe a little bit rougher actually in person depends on what's going on. Like if I get here, like I, like my, my wife knows this and some of my friends know this. when I like, I'll put up with stuff and then all of a sudden I get to a point where I'm done putting up with it. And that's when I start telling you what I think. Now I've tempered myself as an older man. So I don't necessarily just fly off the handle, and, you know, curse and carry on and act like a fool. Um, you know, that was my younger days. Right. Um, but now I might still like, I might still look at you in the eyeball and be like, you're a jackass, <laughs> you know, or you're acting like a jackass, right? Like that might actually happen. Right. Like, and I, you know, to, to bring this back to where I was, you know, what you were just saying a moment ago, I'll be raising my son to kind of know, like the people that are willing to say that to your face, to your face, those are the people that you can trust the most. Right. And, and, and you may not trust them necessarily because like if somebody drops, you know, if somebody drops the N bomb on you, like you may not want to trust them. But yeah. It's a different a sense, type of trust. Yeah. Right. But in a sense you can trust them. Like, okay, I know exactly what they feel about me. Yeah. Right. I, I, I like, I have no doubt, but it, it's that person that says something like, you know, bless your heart. And that just, just to use a cheesy example, you know, <laughs> bless your heart. Well, that sounds nice. But we all know what you're saying. But there are other words, there are other ways of saying things where you're not really clear, and you're like, Does "That person hate me? They like me? They're like, wait, are, are they being snarky?" And you're not really sure. And I hate that, you know. And my so like, I, I'm you know like it's obvious. I'm probably obvious that I'm not white. I'm 20% Native American. Mm. My wife is uh, is very is very Asian. She's 100% Asian. So my son is very visibly Asian. And so I'm like, all right, he's gonna probably. I assume. I assume that you know, he'll come across people saying unpleasant things because they're in a bad mood one day, whatever, you know, maybe, maybe they really are a racist. I doubt he's going to run into too many real racists anymore, but he might, you know? And so I want to teach him like that very lesson, like, Hey, keep him at arm's length, but you can trust the person that's willing to say something to your face a whole lot more than the person that won't. Yeah. One of the interesting things about when um, my kids uh, encountered their first racist racial incident, mm -hmm. it was from Mexican kids. And mm -hmm. like I said, my kids are half Mexican, but it was Mexican kids that were saying things to them uh, of a racial nature. For me, uh, the first time I remember being called the N-word was the third grade. Wow. And it was pretty ironic because the kid, it was actually two kids. One of the kids, we just never got along, so to speak. The other kid, we ended up being best friends for <laughs> through elementary school into junior high. 
and we, it was interesting because I would go to his house because we 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 found common ground. We both like military stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we found common ground in the library because we'd be in the same section of books and we'd be checking out the same books and I would go over to his house and he had a huge Confederate. His family was from Arkansas. He okay. had a huge Confederate flag in his room and we would play with his civil war figurines. And obviously he was the Confederacy and I was the North <laughs> and I BS you not. He always said he won. <laughs> and there's, <laughs> we, when we talk about, um, you know, government education, it's pretty clear the, the union won the civil war. Mm -hmm. And at his house, the union didn't win a damn battle. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and that was me. At my house, we had the green army, man. Right. And, you know, it was an equitable battle. Uh, you know, because we used to split the forces. You pick this guy, I pick this guy. Right. Him, it was like, you know, I'm pretty sure he had more cannons than I did. But it's interesting when you actually give people a chance and get to know them. Mm -hmm. And I, one of those things that were that re, that statement reminded me of is when my daughter she started kindergarten when she was four. She turned, and that was in the September, and she turned five in November. Okay. But she had this little friend, this little chunky Mexican girl. And my daughter is a pretty girl because most mixed kids are typically, um, it, this was a study in America, most uh, mixed kids are found more attractive than purebreds or whatever, <laughs> you know. <laughs> right. AKC humans, you know, I right. don't know. Um, but he was uh talking to this little chubby mexican girl and the so-called cool kids went up to her as if she was one of them and says don't talk to her we don't like the way she dresses and right. that was in kindergarten and my daughter i remember her telling me the story she said dad i told them i don't care about how she dresses she's my friend right and i was very blessed and fortunate because i say this about my daughter she is the nicest person I've ever met in my entire life. Mm -hmm. She cares more about your feelings than she does hers to her own detriment at times. And I've tried to temper that. Right. right. And you being an empathetic individual is something I think if, especially in light of all these culture wars that we're going through right now, if you're an empathetic individual, I think we could find more common ground instead of more conflict. And like I was telling you uh, in the pregame before we came on live, one of the things I truly appreciate for myself and uh, my family is during their early formative years, we were not in this current culture war. Right. right. And this current culture war, I don't think it – serves anybody's best interest no. because what you're doing on the liberal side is you're you're creating more hardcore conservatives and what you're doing on the conservative side you're creating more hardcore liberals right instead of moving to a direction where we can all understand that nobody should have an influence on how you raise your kids other than you and that's where it comes into the fact that, you know, you should know what books your kids are checking out in the library. Mm -hmm. You should be monitoring your kids' education. Yep. You should be monitoring your kids' growth and, and maturity and, and moving in that direction. And if you think some other people are influencing your kids so much that they are going out of the playing field that you've established for them on how you want to uh, raise your kids, that's your fault. That's yeah. not society's fault. And that's where we're not taking responsibility for ourselves as parents, where we think these politicians are going to fix those social issues that you don't want your children dealing with or what your, you, you don't want those particular things influencing your children. 
if you're going to default to somebody you dislike as being that person or entity or, or idea that's influencing your kids, maybe you shouldn't have kids in the first place. Right. Because that's your damn fault. If somebody else is telling your kid their particular pronouns or whatever that is, that's your fault. Right. You can be accepting of other people as like, Hey, that's good for you. It's not for me. Mm -hmm. And if they can't respect that F them. Right. You know, just keep it moving. You know, you, not everybody's going to, I remember I've seen a psychologist before. I'm not afraid to admit that because I've dealt with depression mm -hmm. and I remember telling her, I want to be everybody's friend. And she's like, you can't be everybody's friend. I was like, no, I can. And I'm a, I'm going to try to be everybody's friend because that's just the, the person I am mm -hmm. where I think we all can get along. We all can find common ground. We all can find a way to make it in this world without harming somebody else. Right. And you know, that's the, the incredible mission that I have tried to undertake as a father is making sure my kids understand that we all have a place in this society and we all don't have to have your place in our lives. Mm -hmm. And so to speak, and to get to your point about, um, size yeah i'm six five about 245 mm -hmm. so i never had a, a lot of, i call it biff i never had a I lot see. of problems after i attained this mass because you know i've been told i'm an intimidating presence and and biff is black intimidation factor so a six five okay. 245 pound black dude walking up and say i don't think that's a good idea which right. i have actually had to do this i took my family to disneyland this past january and this dude was abusing his girlfriend mm. and he was probably like five, eight, five, nine tops, maybe 145, 150 pounds. Right. And right. he was like head butting her and putting his hands on her neck. He was obviously drunk. And my daughter was there with me. And I was like, okay, if I'm ever going to use this motherfucker, oh, excuse me, this guy better be a UFC fighter or something right. like that. But I'm going to use that intimidation factor of my size to show my daughter this is not how a man should ever treat a woman. And there's, right. one, there's, there's an absolute factor for me when it comes to men. If you put your hands on a woman, you have zero, less than zero respect for me, and I will fight you. And that's not something I say lightly. I just have a daughter. And if somebody ever touched my daughter, as long as I, I got like maybe 10, 12 years left of fist in me. Right. After that, you know, I might have to kick it up a notch. Right. Or, you might have uh, to hire it out, right? <laughs> well, you know, I'm all about the Second Amendment. I'm just going to yep, leave yep, that, yep, that yep, right yep. there. But, you know, if I don't have a fair to better chance of being victorious in a conflict, I'm not going to engage in it. Right. But I knew I had that factor when I saw it and I vocally told him, don't touch her again. Mm -hmm. And he heard me. So he moved away from me, but with my height, I had still had the vantage point where I could see him wherever he went. Right. And then he moved away about 30, 40 feet away and he started doing it again. So I went up to him. And I told him, you touch her again, and it's going to be me and you. And then I stood there in between the two of them. They were, he was right here. She was right here. Mm -hmm. And I just stood there. And this was at Disneyland. And they did the slickest crap ever, right? They pretended, apparently they saw what was going on. They pretended like the tram broke down to give them enough time to place all their security guards and the police in their position to effect a uh, arrest against this guy. Hmm. And I was like, dude, that was some chess moves right there. Right. What pissed me off about that whole situation was the men that came up to me, the dads and the fathers that came up to me and said, thank you for doing that. And I looked at him. I was like, dude, I, I can't accept your apology because if you call yourself a father, call yourself a dad, and you have a daughter. Why didn't you do that? 
Right. Why, why didn't you step up? And at least you don't have to present what I, cause I presented potential violence to the guy. You don't have to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, and I used to box, I used to do a little, a little thing so I can handle my own. Mm-hmm. And there's a reason why there's, uh, divisions and weight classes in combat sports. Right. You yeah. know, you know, and I knew I had all of those advantages, which I typically do. I, I really don't like people bigger than me. I find that kind of crazy because right. like I said, yeah. I'm not a small guy, but uh, yeah. I don't like yeah. people bigger than me, but I knew I had all the advantages to take. And even when you don't have those advantages, you can still present yourself as a, a a father and a dad in front of your daughter where you could say this isn't right mm-hmm. you know you could tell them something and then leave yourself a path to retreat or back out of the situation right obviously because that's every tactical situation you always have to have a uh a, a somewhere to retreat to a route where you can seek cover or whatever the situation may be you should always have that in the back of your mind yep even if you don't have uh, the advantage but that's what, um, you know, one of those things that I always want to let my kids know, don't ever be afraid to do the right thing, no matter right. what the situation is. And, and let me speak to the small folk out there, all right? <laughs> so all my midget peoples, let me speak to you. Cause again, I'm five foot three, I'm 120 <laughs> pounds soaking wet. Uh, th- there is no biff with me. There is no. Uh, would you call it big intimidation factor or whatever? No, black intimidation oh, black factor because intim- uh, I'm big well, and I'm <laughs> right. So I'm not black and I'm not big. Um, the only B I can get is maybe brazen, right? So that, <laughs> I might get that because, like, I've stood up to dudes before and you know, nose to nose, and they've backed down even though they've been bigger. Because the right. question is, like, it's 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 not that I was scary or intimidating so much as it was like what's up with this little guy that's willing to do this, right? That's, that's generally what's going on. And, and, and there are dudes that aren't going to be intimidated at all. And they'll, they'll take a swing at me. So like, like that can happen folks. Out there. Right. But uh, there was actually an, an incident. Uh, it was about a month ago, maybe a month and a half ago. I was at the park, local park around from my neighborhood. Now I, I live in a relatively nice neighborhood. You don't got a lot of crime. Uh, the surrounding areas is pretty decent. You know, like you, just, you, you might have, some checking of the doors on cars and stuff like that. But for the most part, it's pretty crime free around here. Mm -hmm. And so I took my son over to the park, which is one mile from my home. And we were there and I'm going to give you the brief rundown. Uh, I I don't want to go into it too, too deep, but basically what happened was I got there and there were mostly women there with some kids. And there was, uh, I think one kid knocked down another kid or something like that by accident. And the kid bumped his head, maybe on the, the sidewalk or something like that. But the kid had a little bit of an egg on the head or a not or whatever, whatever term you're used to using. And, um, didn't seem like a big deal. One mom was like, okay, we, we got to go. And the other mom was like, look, they were just kids. They were just playing. And she left. And then like a couple of minutes later, his dad shows up and I guess he was out, out at the parking lot, just sitting in his car and he comes over and he's berating the woman, uh, who's, who's kid done it. So I'm just sitting there and I'm like looking around. I'm like, all right, I'm the only guy other than this man at the park and there's like two or three other, two or three other women. And so I'm like, all right, well, you know, they're away from my son enough. My son's on a different side of the park where I could see. So he's, he's in safe distance away. So Mm -hmm. cool. So I'm just sitting there. I'm like, all right, well, I'm not going to get involved just yet. He's yelling at the woman, which is not appropriate, but he's just yelling. So after a while, remember I told you earlier, there is a point where I get tired of things and I got (laughs) tired of yelling at the woman because I'm like, dude, one, you're not solving any problems because at, at what he was, what he wanted was he was like, you know, I got to take my kid to the hospital. You need to pay the bills. The woman's like, look, just take your kid to the hospital. I'm not paying the bills. I'm not giving you my number. It, the kids were playing. They got hurt. It's a no big deal. Move on. That that was yeah. kind of gratitude. And she was very, very pleasant about it. She was not, she, she was not, well, she might've been antagonistic when she started saying, you know, uh, Jesus loves you. Um, I think that antagonized him. <laughs> but at some point I finally get up and I'm like, dude. I'm like, can you just stop? I'm like, do we need to call the police? Which was not my brightest of moves. Um, because it's basically telling people, I'm going to call people to come beat you up. That's basically, yeah. you might as well just said, I'm going to call my homies and they're going to come and get you. Same day. They're gang. Like, yeah. They're, like, they're, same kind of gang members. Yeah. So now the oh. now he's yelling at me. We're nose to nose. Right. And I'm looking up at him because dude's like four to six inches taller than me. 
right? Mm. And he outweighs me by at least 50 pounds. Uh, and he's been and drinking, so that's that's fun. And so yeah. now he's yelling at me face to face, you know, like, what would you do? And I'm like, well, I would take my kid to the hospital. I'm like, instead of sitting here yelling at somebody and making all the kids afraid. But what made me angry about it was one dude like, okay, yell at the woman a little bit and move on. Fine, whatever, no big deal. Yeah. It's not appropriate, but not the end of the world either. But you kept doing it. And by doing so, you make this playground uh, like a, it's not no longer a hospitable place for the children to play. And I'm like, I can't focus as well on my son because mm. I'm observing you to see if you're going to get crazy and take a swing at the woman or do something that would require me to jump in. And there's a number of reasons why I involved one. I got tired of it and that's just my personality. And I, you know, again, it could have been somebody your size and I would have done the same exact thing. Uh, knowing that I might've got beat down to a pulp possibly. Um, mm. but I, I stood up to him. Uh, he didn't really back down so much. We, we exchanged our words. Um, at one point my son starts walking over closer to me and I'm like, stay over there, son. It'll be fine. No big deal. But I look back. I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't like how I handled it necessarily. And I actually invited Maj Ture on to talk about the show and say, Hey, look, you talk about self-defense you talk about de-escalation tell me everything tell me i did everything wrong, wrong right and we right. walked we through walk. that but at the same time i still think it was the right thing to 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 at some point say something for several reasons number one it's the right thing to do right. number two and you know you mentioned your daughter i i don't have a daughter i have a son but you also have a son and i don't know if your son was with you that day he was but he saw his dad stand up for what was right. And this is what I keep trying to tell people. I'm like, dads, you like, you need to step up when it's appropriate and in an appropriate way. I mean, just don't go, don't go blazing gun, you know, guns in gun blazing, you know, don't go swinging at somebody necessarily, but you need to do it for your daughters so that they recognize this is how a proper man acts. Exactly. This is the kind of man that I'm going to find myself with. Right. I'm not going to find myself with some bum that's not going to protect anybody because if he doesn't protect other people, will he protect me? Maybe not. Hard right. Say. Sons, you need to protect your wives, your sisters, your moms, somebody else's sister and mom. Right. You, you know, and, and so this is like to me, the thing that you did, the thing that I did, and, and I can't speak to whether or not everything you did was right. It sounds like it was you know done in a very um, correct manner. So as not to unnecessarily escalate a situation. Uh, mine was not so much. Uh, I could have handled it a little bit better while still intervening. Right. But the point being, we as dads, this is our responsibility. Our Precisely. responsibility is, hey, I'm going to observe what's going on at school. I'm going to observe what you're watching on YouTube. I'm going to observe the friends that you're hanging out with. I'm going to observe the world around me and show you. How a man acts. So if my son, well, not if, but when my son becomes a man, he hopefully will act that same way. And he will expect those around him to act that same way. And he won't, he won't hang out with bums. I, I like to say bums because yeah. <laughs> I watch too many rock <laughs> movies. Uh, you know, I don't want him, I don't want him to associate with bums. I want you to associate with good people that are gonna, you know, expect yeah. those around him to be good and to maybe intervene. So I think it was a great story, and I didn't mean to take up too much time talking about my story. No, not at all. And um, one thing I, I want to say to the fathers out there, you know, being that I did what I did, I've always told my son, you're not a female genital part if you walk away. Right. You know, because when I was younger, that's what they called us. If mm -hmm. you de-escalated or walked away from a fight, that you are weak and you can't hang there there that that is i i can't stress that enough where mm -hmm. i wanted to break that generational because that's a multi-generational thought process mm -hmm. if you don't fight or you know something goes wrong for you somebody does something wrong and you walk away that means you're less than a man no right. it doesn't Right. That means you're a big, for me, that means you're a bigger man. 
if you could walk away and de-escalate a situation where you know somebody's going to get hurt, whether it be you or them, mm -hmm. um, my preference is them. <laughs> and it will always be them because I'm a huge Second Amendment advocate. Like I said, I got maybe 10 more years of, of fists, uh, left and right uppercut, or mm -hmm. the, I like the Mike Tyson, go to the body, right? Uh, go a right to the body, then a, a right to the kidney, then a right uppercut. Right. That's, right. that's my go-to because you fold them and then they drop their chin and you don't have to work as hard. That's what I'd like to do when I, when, if I have to box somebody, but there's nothing wrong with saying to yourself, this isn't the situation for me. Right. I need yeah. to walk away because I did get in a fight when I was 18 years old and here in the state of California, I played no contest to a battery. And in the state of California, a battery charge, you can't own a firearm for 10 years. Oh, wow. So I, did, I wasn't able to own a firearm until I was 28 years old. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I told my son, don't be, you know, if the situation calls for it, you, you handle your business. Mm -hmm. But if you could walk away, walk away. Right. Yeah. So it's like what I tell people, I say, I don't like violence. I really don't. I, I don't um, but I'm not afraid of it. <laughs> not at and, all. And, and I like what Maj told me on the podcast. He said something that his, I think it was his grandma. He said, uh, she would say, I would rather people say, there she goes than there she lays. Right. right? And I'm like, that, that's true. And so on one hand, I think that, you know, I want my son to, to grow up knowing that violence, is, we, we don't like violence, but if it comes down to it, we are prepared, right? If it, if right. it has to happen, we are prepared, but we will do our best to um, avoid violence, but at the same time, stick up for people. And, and a lot of times, and it's very situational, you know, he'll have to learn, you know, as he's growing up you know, how to read a situation. I read the situation slightly wrong and I approached it in, you know, in some incorrect manner. Um, but there are ways to deescalate or to at least intervene and, you know, prevent people, other people from being harmed any further. And, yeah. and sometimes that just might be like, Hey, you know what? This is not the, this is not the altercation for me. I'm stepping away far enough and I'm going to call the police. And I know libertarians don't like to hear that, but, you know, that's kind of their job to call out, to come out and deal with these situations. They have guns, they have backup tasers and all that good stuff. Right. So they have things and to some degree privilege that we don't have to deal right. with the conflict, you know? So I, I, you know, so I don't want to encourage anybody that you should just go out there and start fighting guys left and right. Like that would be stupid and don't do that. <laughs> um, but you, sh you know, as a man, you should, you, sh you know, you should generally be, prepared to if you have to um but work really hard to avoid it i want to talk about something else and, and do you have time i know we're over time yeah, we're, we're good we're good so i want to bring up something because you mentioned earlier and i think this is very critical and i think you will wholly agree with me on this so you mentioned earlier like hey it's your job as a dad to figure this out and you, and you can't go and say well um you know hey they're they're teaching my kids something that I don't like. What should I ever do? Oh no, woe is me. That's that's the wrong attitude. And I, the the thing I thought about at the moment, and it it was it was like a light bulb. I was like, a lot of people would say, I would die for my children, mm -hmm. and that's a good thing. We don't want to diminish uh, diminish that. Absolutely, you should you should be willing to die for your child. Right. If you're willing to die for your child, then figuring out what they're being taught, what they're watching on TV. Who's who they're hanging out with, all these other things that are hard, legitimately hard, shouldn't be nearly as much of a problem. Because if you're willing to lay your life down, then surely you can figure out what friends are hanging out with. Surely you can figure out what they're being taught in school and you can deal with that appropriately. Maybe it's pulling them out of school. I had a dad on a while back. He his child was uh his daughter, I think it was his daughter, was hanging around a crowd and and it became the popular in thing in that particular crowd to label yourself as trans and it started affecting his daughter's behavior in a very negative way in a way that was, you know, that was, um, destructive to the family. 
because she started hiding things and all this other stuff. And so they ended up pulling her, you know, once they got to the bottom of it, they figured out what was going on. Um, they ended up there. They determined that, Hey, the answer for us is to move schools. We need to, we right. need to separate you from these group of friends because in this particular case, and it's not always the case with the trans and the LGBTQ, but in this particular case, they determined you, it was harmful. Right. And that's what a dad does. Right. And so any further thoughts on this idea? Like if you're laying down your life, then finding out what they're watching on YouTube shouldn't be that friggin' hard. Yeah. Um, I want to talk to that, that concept for one real quick, because, you know, in, in the culture wars, they're saying, you know, people shouldn't be taking their kids to drag shows, story times and things of that nature. You know, me personally, that wasn't for me. I, I wasn't going to take my kids to anything like that. But when you say that, you're asking the government to intervene in your life and say who you can and cannot hang out with. That's the precedent of what you're doing. Because I like looking at things in the big picture. Um, like I said, that's not for me. That's not for my family mm -hmm. to take my kids to such events and whatnot. But right. when you right. tell the government that they should be outlawing all people from being able to take their kids there and you don't ask what possibly could go wrong with that situation mm -hmm. in the future because the precedent is the government determining uh who you're freely uh allowed to interact with mm -hmm. and let's say conservatives lose power and now liberals are in charge and the president has been set that the government can say who you can and can't hang around with. What's to stop the liberals and the feminists and everybody else from saying, well, I don't want you going to that church because that church teaches you certain X, Y, and Z things. Right. Teaches right. hate according to yeah. them. Right. According to them. Yeah. And when you allow government to take control of your life and that's basically what these culture wars are boiling down to mm -hmm. is which form of government do you want saying this is good and this isn't right and if you're going to allow the government you know you know what we're seeing right now in a lot of states is they're putting christianity into the public educational sphere mm -hmm. and that's setting a precedent it is and what I don't think people understand is this has been done before in Oklahoma where they brought Christianity into the state house with the 10 commandments. And then some Satanists said, if they can have their idol or statue, uh, conferring their religion upon the public, so can we. Right. And so the state of Oklahoma had to allow some Satanists to put a statue of their goat headed God. Right. Uh, in the same place as the 10 commandments. Is that the one that made news and got knocked down? Yeah. And somebody behaved their Bahamian, whatever the, whatever the hell their, <laughs> their, yeah, their God is called. And that's where, you know, Americans are failing to understand the gist of these culture wars. It, it, one team may win in the short term, but eventually the other team is going to get their, their turn yep. to impose their version of your restrictions upon us all. Yep. And, you know, if you don't have that simple mind frame to understand the peril that comes with, you know, using the government to impose your personal will, you will at some point in your life get there because right. the other team is going to be in charge and and that's where we need a viable third option in our government because right now we have one more choice than what they have in north korea and right. everybody yeah. wants to talk about north korea is just a total uh mecca of, of bs and whatnot we're, we're we're one option more than them right and the the thing about democrats and republicans their ultimate goal is the one party system. And I don't know who's going to win. 
a, right. a one party system historically has never been a system where every individual has enjoyed the natural born rights that their creator has given them. Mm-hmm. Nowhere in the history of mankind has a totalitarian ruler made sure everybody within the system of government that they may have had had the right to live their life as they so choose and that is the grand experiment of america that's what this place was supposed to be in our in 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 the very conception of america and it hasn't truly lived up to everything it was supposed to be but this was supposed to be a place where individual liberty was the foundation of every interaction that we saw fit to do so in a non uh harmful manner to others right. where whereas we could go out create our business sell our products not doing any harm to anybody else where we could go out and work for somebody that we so chose to work for and we're not doing any harm to anybody else and we could do these things solely based on our creators uh what he gave us at our conception that's my personal point of view Mm -hmm. is that conception that's not for everybody right but that's that's what america is supposed to be right and that's what i fight for and i don't find that in the duopoly i only find that somewhat in the libertarian party not so much now at the national convention but i'm not going to give up just yet because every party goes through its ups and downs and whatnot but that's where we're at currently in our society Whereas we are made to choose one or the other. And instead of bringing the third viable party into the mix, our party decided to uplift one side over the other at the national convention, even though they say they invited both uh, uniparties to speak. We need to uplift our candidates that, believe in what we believe in the individual liberty free association and whatnot because you're not responsible for your neighbor's kids other than making sure your neighborhood is safe right you know and everybody wants to say i'm protecting children the number one problem with kids in america and this is from my professional life is hunger Mm. and if you're not making sure every kid in your community is fed a dinner tonight i don't give a crap about what you think they're being taught in school right because yeah. if they're not if if they're hungry going to bed they're not going to be any damn good in school right so when you talk about i want to protect children start with the first measure of their life it's it's nutrition and health care right then we get to education but what are you truly asking for? Are you asking for more government to come into our life and our society to regulate what you can and can't do. That's the exact opposite of what I think libertarians are and what society needs. That's a good point. I'm going to follow up with that and then give you the last word before we before I close the show. Right. So I like that you said, you know, yeah. hey, Hunger is a bigger problem. Now, I I can't verify that. I'm going to go on your word that it is that it is the biggest problem that children face in the United States. I will say this though: uh, once upon a time, before my ch- my son was born, uh, so I my in my younger years, I was a youth director uh, at a church, and I worked with um, kids that were at risk. And, you know, a lot of them, some of them knew all the police officers on the force. Like they were Mm. one step away from going juvie hall, you know, detention forever and a day, you know, and, and they were, they were from the rough side of town. And when I moved to Jacksonville before my son was born, I actually still had a passion for teenagers and young kids, you know, helping them out and being a mentor. So I joined a local organization called Daniel kids. Um, And they actually have a building like, right around the corner from my house. Um, but, uh, they, uh, so I got involved and I had to go to like a training class. It was like a two hour class. And they said, you know, this is where we lose a lot of people. 
they don't even want to do the two, it was a two hour training. Like you just sit there and they, they basically tell you what is kind of obvious. Don't give them money. Don't do this. You're a mentor. You're not a, a bank, you know, stuff, you know, stuff that I would think of as obvious, but maybe not for some people. And, um, but then they said something that just, I have never, I, I will never forget this. Um, they said, cause they, they paired up women with girls, men with boys. And they said, if you know any men, we would love to get some more in here because we can't get enough. We have plenty of girls or plenty of women to match with girls. We do not have enough men to match with boys. boys. And And that just bothers me because like you hear, like I, I, and I've argued with libertarians that are like, Oh, we got to protect kids against transing. We got to protect it. I'm like, what about the kids in your neighborhood? What about the kids in your own city? Are you doing any, are you going out and helping them? Precisely. And, and, and I don't mean helping them not be trans. Like there's plenty of kids that don't have a male role model. Just go be a male role. And the kid that I worked with, he's grown up now. He's married. He's got his own kid. He's never been in trouble with the law. He seemed, you know, as far as I can tell, we, we, we're kind of connected on Facebook. Uh, and I see what he posts. It seems like he's got a good job and he loves his family. So I'm like, well, I didn't ruin him. Like, you know, now to what extent did I really help him? I, I don't really know because I, I can never know where he would have ended up had I not been his final mentor. Because I mentored him from about 15 and a half, 16 to, to when he aged out at 18. Mm-hmm. Right. So I was his last mentor. And, you know, we had some ups and downs. It was it was. So for me, I'm like. If every libertarian that says they care about kids, if they would just go mentor one kid, just one, I feel like they would actually do a whole lot more than all the rabble rousing and trash talking on the internet that they do about how they're protecting children. I think that would be, I I think that would end up making our society just immeasurably better, immeasurably better. If they, if they all did that last word. I 100% concur with what you just said, because the stat in America is one in six kids goes to bed hungry every night. In my school district, we have at least three or four schools where 80 to 86% of the kids receive free lunch and breakfast because of their economic status. Mm-hmm. And in LA USD, Los Angeles Unified School District, it's mm-hmm. 80% of the entire school district wow. where the kids are below the poverty line and they qualify for free uh, breakfast and lunch. If you really love the kids of America, if you're truly concerned about the kids of America, the focus should be on their welfare and not the 2 to 3% of them who may not identify as something you're comfortable with. Mm-hmm. And I'm not putting in light there. There are people who believe, and you know, I don't personally believe that uh, if you were born a male, you went through puberty and you identify as a woman that you should be able to compete in sports against women. And I'm not saying that from a bigoted standpoint. I'm saying that from a standpoint where, my son played travel baseball since he was six years old. We used to go to the batting cages and we used to go to the parks and whatnot. And I would see those girls out there busting their ass for six to eight hours on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, because that's how much they practice. Mm-hmm. And then in the batting cages and perfecting their skill set. My son is 6'6, 225 pounds. If he chose to say i'm done with baseball where the fences are like 315 to 320 at the corners and 400 at center field Mm -hmm. and he can hit the ball over those plus 200 feet Mm -hmm. in every direction softball fields are 200 feet from left to right center it's 200 feet from home plate to the fence if he so chose to say hey I identify as this and I want to play with these girls now 
I don't think that's fair to those girls that busted their ass from the time they were five, six, seven years old. You know, right. so, I, that's just the simple fact because when it comes to male puberty, it's muscle, bone density, aggression, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, just the overall warrior. That's what testosterone does. Mm-hmm. When mm-hmm. females go through puberty, it's reproductive, it's widening hips. It's the ability to give birth to a child or to become pregnant and give birth to a child. There's no athletic advantage in female puberty to male puberty. And that's, that's just the scientific facts. As far as, um, fatherhood is concerned in closing, I just want to impart upon you. Don't be afraid to stand up for the right thing. Mm -hmm. and standing up for the right thing is making sure everybody has a place at the table um it doesn't necessarily have to be at your table in your house but at the public table everybody has the right to stand up for themselves Mm -hmm. but the only time things should be equitable is opportunity uh results can never be equitable as put forth by government. The only equitable part about life should be the opportunity for you to be successful. And if you so choose to take those opportunities, I salute you, excuse me, and and we go forward. If If you undertake those opportunities and you fail, the only person you should find fault upon, fathers, you, you, you say that, to your kids if you fail after you've been given an equitable opportunity you fail that's not the end of the story though mm-hmm. the end of the story is when you stop breathing because as like i i said earlier my dad said as long as you're breathing you can achieve anything and that's what fathers have to impart that ultimate confidence into their children mm-hmm. that they could do whatever they want to do as long as they have the willpower to go forward in a opportunity that's presented to them. And with that, I'll, I'll, I'll close on that. My brother. Awesome. I'm gonna put you backstage. Hold up, hold tight for just a moment while I close the show. Um, no and then we'll chit chat for a moment. Uh, Thank you for you. having me on, bro. Absolutely. Absolutely. Love it. Um, and then, or if you need to go, that's fine too. So, no, I'm good. All right. Hold tight for just a second. All right, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in and watching the show. Uh, I hope you found it informative and inspiring. Be sure to catch me Monday through Friday, 7.30 a.m. for an informed discussion on politics and culture. Make sure you're subscribed to my YouTube channel, or if you prefer my Rumble channel, you can go to youtube.libertydad.com, or you can go to rumble.libertydad.com. While you're there, let me know how I'm doing by leaving me a comment. Last but not least, I want you to remember, if you're a champion of liberty, your business is people and your product is liberty. I want you to have a great weekend. Catch you next time. But for now, I'm out.